So this is a draft of an article that Sarah and I are working on. And the idea that uh, the uh, concept that Sarah started with, and I will update it now, if you've been following the news the last couple of weeks or last months, you will have noticed, for example, that the Dalai Lama wanted to visit South Africa for the 80th birthday of Desmond Tutu, who was one of the prominent anti-apartheid hmm, fighters in South Africa. And the South African government delayed a long time the decision. It seemed that they were not going to give him a visa because they were intimidated by the government of China, because China has, it seems, it seems, appears China has a lot of investment in, in South Africa. And eventually the Dalai Lama said it was just days before the event. So the Dalai Lama didn't go. And then the South African blamed him. How can the government try to blame him for not winning? But uh, Desmond Tutu is a pretty smart man, as I think most of you know. And he set up a video conference. And uh, Dalai Lama was able to really pitch into the government of South Africa during this video conference. So it might have been better off to let him come. Hmm? Then um, the second incident happened even this past week. You may have heard that our Prime Minister was at a Commonwealth summit in Perth, Australia. And at that Commonwealth summit, the previous summit had commissioned a report on human rights in the Commonwealth. And if you think of some of the members of the Commonwealth, well, Zimbabwe is no longer there, but if you think of Nigeria, Kenya, um, Tanzania, uh, many countries do not have Uganda. Many countries have a very poor record on human rights. And this uh, eminent persons group, it was called, was supposed to commission the commission to report on human rights. It came back with all kinds of, you know, about 130 or so points on how to improve human rights in the Commonwealth and the governments with commissions of course, that we want nothing to do with this, we don't even want it published. Um, the issue was finally resolved in, in different words anyway. Point is that um, the government of South Africa and the government of India, two countries that are supposed to be democratic, were in the lead of, of those who didn't want the report published. In the end, somebody leaked it anyway. I mean, I mean when uh, tw more than 20 you know, leaders have it, um, it came out. But anyway, so uh, it was quite critical. So uh, there are two examples of how the government of South Africa certainly didn't adhere to human rights uh, standards in its foreign policy, at least the way we see it in the Western world. And this is the um, paradox with which uh, Sarah began when she did her paper for me. She began, how can a government where people suffered so much from apartheid and extreme human rights abuses, how can such a government hmm, uh, then stand up and, you know, defend governments which abuse human rights? Hmm? So. What we're trying to do here is this is an academic kind of thing. So I'm looking at international relations, as I'm sure Alexander and Sarah uh, would agree, is a much over theorized field. There are so many theories of international relations and they overlap and yeah, so it's not too many. But um, the, of those many this, of these many theories, uh, which uh, beginning with what Sarah did, I added some we picked six as being perhaps the most likely, most relevant ones for the, this study. So the six that I've, um, we picked out begin with um, what's called classical realism, or sometimes, which is associated with the American, uh, long dead American uh, political scientist, Hans Morgenthau. And the idea is, the principal idea, and I'm summarizing like crazy, of course, the principal idea of this kind of realism is that every government seeks to enhance, every government foreign policy is or should, that's another problem, be based on increasing national power, making the, government, the country stronger. Hmm? That's the core idea, right, of, no, I'm quick to that, right, of mm. classical realism. It didn't go anywhere. Mm. Down in the bottom arrow? Yeah. 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 Uh, one more over to the right. One more over to the right. Okay. Because, uh, I, I see the arrow, oh, but where's, where's my cursor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Okay. The next one that we're going to consider is uh, um, 
what is called structural defensive realism, which is associated with an American political scientist, Kenneth Waltz, I think who's still on, but must be a ripe old age, however. Uh, this is why the idea, and this, this all overlaps. The idea is that if you have an international system, then the government's foreign policy is um, to, a large, to a large extent determined by the position of that state within the system. So best example is back in the good old Cold War days where the Soviet Union and the United States and you could explain each of their foreign policies by the fact that they were each the leader of a bloc. Mm -hmm. That was their position, right, in the system. And that's called structural defensive realism. Now, what is Here we are with this. Okay. The next one that I kind of like, and if I have to have realism, this is my favorite, it's called neoclassical realism. It's much more recent. It's associated with a couple of American thinkers. Oh, most of these people are Americans. Also, a couple of British thinkers, actually. This guy's called Gideon Rose. And you know this, you know what? What I really don't like about the, the Microsoft products is he, they, because it's the beginning of the line, they put a capital there. I didn't put that capital in. It shouldn't be there, but they, they think they know better than I do what I want, right? Mm -hmm. And they put a capital in and a capital S. Neither one of which belongs there. But it's a lot of bother to get rid of it. I know how to do it. You have to put it in the mind. Anyway. So the idea here is that whatever there is in the case of uh, national power or the position of the state, that we need to interpret it in terms of the people who actually run the government, who actually make the foreign policy, we need to look what they're thinking, what their background is, what their knowledge is. So it's really the perception of realism as interpreted by the foreign policy makers. That's not too much jargon. Okay? And that's another version of realism. Okay, and this one uh, is called constructivism, and it's associated with an American thinker, again, the lady, Martha Cinema, and she's still very active and still writing. And the idea here is that uh, state foreign policy is shaped by norms and ideas rather than by, you know, material interests. And one of these norms that I'm particularly focusing on is identity. What, how the people who live in that country and who run that country, how they see themselves and what their role is hmm? in the world, in the region, whatever, right? Their sense of identity, sense of belonging. Right there. Okay. And this is uh, closely related to the previous one. This is Alexander Bent, the father of constructivism, much as the other order. Uh, state uh, foreign policy shaped by its role. So the other one, it should be the other way on. The other one is a, uh, this one is a spin-off from the other one, okay. A state's foreign policy is shaped by its national political culture. And this is quite, quite recent, the same kind of, so it is Katzenstein, and state's foreign policy is shaped by its national political culture, so what, the way the people in the country feel and see themselves helps to determine what their foreign policy is. So for many years, Canada saw itself as a peacekeeper. And while this is associated with the American thinker Peter Katzenstein, it really is not such a new idea. Way back in 1972, a well-known, to me, well-known Canadian political scientist called Janice Stairs, I think he's now retired, he eventually ends up as vice president of the University of, of um, in Halifax, at the, the of the University. But he wrote an article way back before he became, you know, vice president, whatever, where he relate, tried to relate Canada's foreign policy to its political culture as a mediator between provinces and, you know, in negotiation and this made Canada an international hmm? mediator. This has changed, but the idea came way back when from Dennis Steers. So there's another one who applied it to a man called Ebel, who probably tried to apply it to Latin America, E-B-E-L. York does have his book. Uh, so it's interesting, but you know, nobody remembers Dennis Steers because when an American comes up with the idea, right, mm -hmm. then it becomes well known. Hmm? But I, I think I, so I've used it for years in my foreign policy classes and associated with Dennis Steers. Okay. So that's, I use those slides because theories are complicated and I'm not going to, I'm not a PowerPoint person normally, this is my first effort at it, but um, I thought it would make things a little bit easier because theories are complicated. Now what uh, I'm going to try and do from now on is to uh, look at South Africa's foreign policy under its second president. So I have one more slide, I'll get that part of the stuff out of the way. The president of South Africa since the end of apartheid. There we are. 
The first one was Nelson Mandela. Of course, I'm mean, you all know heard about him. Has anybody seen the movie Invictus? The wonderful movie, right? The critics did like it. He's here? No? Yeah, good movie, yeah. Nelson Mandela, almost a saint, you know, Tabo and Becky, who followed uh, um, Mandela. Uh, and Becky was pushed out by his own political party, so he was succeeded by Kalema Motlante. That's a click sound, but I don't have. I was told that if you live, come from northern Botswana, you don't need to say the click sound. So I just say it. That's taunty. <laughs> so that I am from northern Botswana. I am. We have that. Okay, and Jacob Zuma, who's the president now of South Africa. And what we're going to do in the article is we're going to focus not on Mandela, but on M M M Mbeki, the second president, hmm? and how South African foreign policy developed after the initial idealistic hmm, impetus of the end, success of the anti-apartheid movement. So, hmm? so, by the way, someone time me if I talk too long, you tell me. Um, so and when uh, Nelson Mandela became president, uh, so in, uh, shortly after he made a speech on foreign policy, as the president is expected to do, and he said that the uh, human rights would be the guiding light of South African foreign policy. And this makes every bit of perfectly good sense, right? Because anti-apartheid, I mean, after the Holocaust, apartheid is one of the worst of the 20th century human rights hmm? abuses. Well, there was apartheid, there was, um, you know, there were other things in Stalin, the Soviet Union, we won't go into all this. And, the arguments they're having in Winnipeg as to what the worst abuses were. You heard about that? The human rights museum in Winnipeg. And they can't agree what to feature. Well, I'll tell you something. In, in, um, in, if you ever get a chance to go to Johannesburg, or if you've been there, there's an anti-apartheid museum right on the border of Soweto and Johannesburg. A very wonderful, moving place. Uh, one of the ladies who worked at the college here, the Chantal Lissing man, she went there. I have been there, but I'm a tough girl. But she was really, like, really moved by this really a dreadful story of the things that were done, right? It's almost like going to a Holocaust museum. Anyway, for example, I'll give you one example. Tabo and Becky had one son, and he disappeared as a teenager in 1981. And they've never found a body. They don't know what happened to him. He's gone. Hmm? That was apartheid. Right? They just shot people and buried them in unmarked graves. Last I heard, they were digging up these unmarked graves and doing DNA tests. So they could find his son, not because he wants to do it, his ex-wife wants to do it. Hmm? That's the kind of things that happened. Similarly, with Tabo and Becky's brother, he disappeared. Body was found in that case after a time. But these are the kind of things, right? That happened. Okay. Uh, so Mandela wanted to make human rights a guiding light of South African foreign policy. He actually tried to practice. He's that kind of person who practiced what he preached. And in the example, which Sarah demonstrated very well in her presentation to the class. In 1996, there was a Commonwealth summit. At that time, Nigeria, Nigeria being one of the worst governed Commonwealth countries probably, at that time, Nigeria was governed by one of its many dictators called Abacha, and he was about to execute the opposition leader called Kensel Weaver. And so while the Commonwealth summit was going on, uh, Mandela tried to get a unanimous resolution out of the Commonwealth summit to stop this, to make, to, uh, urge Abacha not to execute um, Cancelo Viva. But the others wouldn't hear of it. They wouldn't interfere with the domestic affairs of another country. And Cancelo Viva was killed even while the summit was going on. Mm -hmm. And Mandela was humiliated because his policy was rejected. But this was kind of a term where Mandela did not give up. He's not that kind of person. Like he didn't give up after 27 years on Robben Island. And again, if you go to South Africa, you've got to go to Robben Island to see the conditions of the prison. I know which these people were kept. You can, you can actually tour the prison. And as, as of now, you know, the guides are former inmates, because mm -hmm. there were lots of those. Hmm? So it's a mere five minutes by boat, or ten minutes by boat from Cape Town. Anyway, so um, <coughs> it didn't change Mandela's foreign policy. But in, and Becky became president in 1999, and he uh, decided to follow a more African-focused foreign policy. Mm -hmm. which was not so singularly focused on human rights, at least as we see it in the Western world. Do you know what they call the Western world in, Afri in Southern Africa? You know what do they call the Western world in Southern Africa? They call it the North. Mm -hmm. When I go there in January, I'll be teaching a course called The Politics of the North, the EU and the United States. That's what they call it. What we call the Western world, they call it the North. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, no? 
Yeah. 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 When the North is not like the Soviet, uh, Russia or China or anything, right? It's the developed Western world. Hmm? That's what my course will be. I'll start the course once before. It's kind of fun to teach. Get the graduate course, because they don't have to know about the North till they get to the graduate course, right? Level for that thing. No, well, I can. Anyway. So, uh, Mbeki became president, and what I want to do now is um, focus on Mbeki. There's two reasons for doing that. One is that the Constitution of South Africa gives the president primary responsibility for foreign policy. Let me look at my notes at all. This is what I never I do. And then, uh, secondly, small developing countries normally, it's sort of a, a given of foreign policy studies, that it, the smaller the country, especially the developing country, the foreign policy will be that of either the president or the foreign minister, or a small group anyway. You know, it's a personalist, we call a personalist foreign policy. Hmm? Sort of a rule of thumb that we go by in foreign policy studies. Okay, so, we, so that's our justification, right, for focusing on, on Mbeki. And I'm, we're going to have, in the, in the final article, there'll be at least three, there'll be three case studies. One in Zimbabwe, one in Sudan in the International Criminal Court, and one on South Africa's first term as a member of the Security Council from 2006 to 2008, which coincides with Mbeki's presidency. Hmm? But here, I don't know what time it is, but I'm going to just talk a little bit about Zimbabwe, not about the other two. Hmm? Just Zimbabwe. It's familiar to most of you. It's ruled by a man called Mugabe, who's hated even over most of Africa. as a particularly cruel and, you know, uh, uh, hmm? selfish dictator. Uh, now, but let's look at Zimbabwe in relation to South Africa. That's what we're talking about. South African foreign policy toward Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. It's a neighboring country, and they have a common history. They're the only two countries in Africa which were governed by a white minority mm -hmm. until the white minority was overthrown and the majority government took over. All the other con countries in Africa except uh, Ethiopia were colonies. Mm -hmm. But these two were governed by their own... Hmm? black, uh, own white minority. Hmm? So it's not exactly a colony, mm -hmm. a different kind of situation. So they have a common history, hmm? to some extent. And um, when, um, okay, let me get some facts in here. Zimbabwe overs was able to overthrow its white minority and become, get a black majority government in 1980, 1979-80, with the help of Margaret Thatcher, who had no use for Africa. Yes, Margaret Thatcher, who accomplished that, who negotiated it. Because she didn't want that problem hanging on her neck. She wanted to do other things, you know, in England, in Britain itself, and she was determined to get that problem off her plate. Hmm? So, um, in Zimbabwe became a majority country ruled by the majority of its people briefly in 1980. South Africa didn't get its new democratic constitution in 94. The real negotiations that were Mandela was taking off for Auburn Island in 91. So it took you know, two, three years of negotiations. But eventually uh, South Africa also overthrew its white minor minority and got a majority, gov majority government, which includes the white minority, right? Which is not the case in Zimbabwe, really. So they have a common, common history. But there was this 10-year gap. So during those 10 years, when Mugabe was already ruler, he's been ruler non-stop mm. from 80 until now. He's, he's well advanced to his 1980s now. I, I, nobody knows what, how, what his house is like. He seems to be okay. Uh, gotta tell, I got to tell you one of those stories. The, there was a summit meeting of the Southern, Southern African Development Community in, in, in Botswana when I was there. And I have a good friend who's a taxi driver. And he told me they, when they had the summit meeting, all of the leaders stayed in the biggest, fanciest hotel, of course. Not Mugabe. Not because he didn't want to be with the others. He went to the meetings, and to take his meals and to stay, he went to a different hotel. Also a nice hotel, but not the big palatial one. The other one's been staying. So for some reason, maybe it's a, he has some physical My guess would be he has physical problems. Maybe he was eating or something. I don't know. But he, he didn't... Hmm? He wouldn't stay with the other leaders. He only came for the meetings. Because taxi drivers would know this, right? <laughs> they have to bring them back and forth. Well, anyway. So Mugabe is still the di dictator of Zimbabwe. Uh, he was an elected leader initially. And during those 10 years that uh, Zimbabwe was free and South Africa was not, uh, they did help. The Zimbabwe borders on South Africa. And they did help the... Um, 
uh, African National Congress, the people who crossed the border who were trying to oppose the government. Before that, they were not able to flee into Zimbabwe. They couldn't flee into Botswana because the Botswana government had its own problems. They could to some extent, but I won't go to all that. But they couldn't flee in Namibia. It didn't even exist, right? It was barely existed. So there was no place to go, hmm? really, except maybe Mozambique. Or, hmm? They couldn't go to Swaziland and Sudan either for different reasons. So it was very helpful to the African National Congress to have a neighboring country which could be a base hmm, for opposition to the government. Um, and Mbeki himself has spoken of the blood, blood bonds, as he calls them, formed during the anti-apartheid struggle, hmm? uh, when he and Mugabe helped the African National Congress. Um, the story that I, one of the main stories I've come across is that in 1990, when the negotiations between the African National Congress and the uh, uh, apartheid government were just beginning, that at that time Mugabe already you know, had the idea of kicking out the white farmers and taking over the land. You know what happened to Zimbabwe? They took over the land of the white farmers. And this used to be a breadbasket of the country. Now they, it can't even feed itself. They kicked out the white farmers and, and took their land away. And this also deprived many, it, maybe one black farmer will get the farm, but the other laborers lose their jobs. So this creates unemployment as well. And, uh, to be in a big issue. But anyway, Mugabe wanted to do this for a long time. But apparently in 1990, when he started it, and Becky and the others were negotiating, and he, they persuaded Mugabe not to do anything until the negotiations were completed in 1994. Well, actually, it eventually didn't happen until 2000. Because they thought that it would scare the white South Africans during the negotiations mm -hmm. and make them more difficult. Yeah. So that's another debt of gratitude, right? That the old Mugabe, that the uh, African government owes to Mugabe. Um, but in 2000, um, Mugabe began a so called land reform in earnest. And that meant that the, many of the white farmers left. That They wouldn't go to South Africa, of course, but they did go. Actually, it's, it's a little known story where they went. Some of them went you know, back to Europe, North America, even, right? There's some here. But, uh, the Nigerian government is taking some of them in. I saw that. Oh, we lived here on the, CBC, on the BBC the other night. They went to Nigeria because Nigeria doesn't produce very much of its own food and they wanted some skilled farmers. Mm -hmm. And some of them I know, some a friend of mine discovered this. Who's, uh, I have a friend who's writing a piece here on agricultural policy in Africa. She ran into ex Zimbabwean farmers in northern Botswana. They brought them in to farm and produce food because Botswana imports 80% of its food from South Africa. So they brought in these farmers who would farm just across the border so they would know the land, the conditions, the climate. Mm -hmm. Nigeria is quite different. They're having problems there. But that's the same climate, the same, you know, mm -hmm. the same soil. I mean, the border is just there. So, um, so anyway, so he, in 2000, Mugabe began his land reform in good, earn, good and earnest, and many refugees left and began to leave, and there was an outcry in the Western world against people being deprived of their property and, you know, kicked off their land without any compensation. Then in 2002, there were elections in Zimbabwe, and they were obviously rigged. Uh, quite obviously, there uh, the, was a Commonwealth observation team which pointed out that these elections were not open or fair at all. But the South African observers from the uh, South African mm -hmm. Development Community, they didn't say much. Well, oh, you know, maybe it wasn't that bad. Hmm? That's basically what they said. Um, and as the, 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 <coughs> the Zimbabwean problem got worse over the years, by 2008, it reached, it reached its crisis. It was the worst, right? There was another election in uh, 2008, and it was obviously rigged, and um, this time it was pretty clear that the opposition had won. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, um, Mugabe put the, some of the opposition leaders in jail, and uh, there was a... F uh, in the meanwhile, the government just sort of it almost disintegrated, like Zimbabwe, compared to most African countries, had good infrastructure. It had roads, hospitals, schools, hmm? which many other African countries don't have. And suddenly, with the government, as the government disintegrated and concentrated on this so-called land reform, the hospitals closed, the schools closed, and the water supply broke down, so the cholera broke out. Uh, by the end of 2008, it was just... Oh, I was At that time, I was just new there, and I was in a bed and breakfast in Botswana, and there was a, uh, a Zimbabwe nurse there looking for work in Zimbabwe, in Botswana, but, you know, they had. Anyway, I was staying in, 
the, the adapter on my laptop. It was, I still had a Canadian laptop then. The adapter broke one evening. What am I going to do? I can't charge my computer. She says, oh, just don't worry about it. She took that plug apart. And she took the walls and stuck some straight into the wall. Into the and I said, good God, what are you doing, Mom? She said, that's okay. Your computer's working. And besides, she said, in Zimbabwe, we don't have access to anything. We have to make do. We learn how to do these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how bad it was, right, in Zimbabwe by the, by the fall of, uh, by the end of 2008. So um, what was the reaction of the government of South Africa to all of this? Uh, first of all, there were refugees. Over the 10-year period, about 2 million refugees, many of which went to South Africa. There was um, economic problems um, uh, uh, because the, the South Africa is one of Zimbabwe's main trading partners. Then South Zimbabwe, like Botswana, got most of the electricity from South Africa, and the government hadn't paid the bills. So they were getting the electricity free from South Africa. Um, what did uh, President Mbeki do? He advocated quiet diplomacy. He didn't want to take a tough stand. Uh, he wanted to negotiate, and he did negotiate some kind of an agreement whereby the opposition leader was able to get out of jail uh, and whereby they're supposed to cooperate with him. But they haven't ever, like Zimbabwe has never really cooperated with, uh, they ever really accepted this agreement. So let's see, the opposition leader and his principal advisors out of jail and then a few months later, they put the man who would have been the foreign minister with the foreign policy advisor to uh, Zingrali, who was the lead, opposition leader, hmm? they put him back in jail. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like on Mugabe's face, smart old guy, right? The opposition didn't do anything, nor did South Africa, nor the others. They basically let it be, which showed Mugabe that he could get away with it. Mm -hmm. hmm? Yeah. So, uh, so, the, the, so, um, uh, President uh, Becky advocated quiet diplomacy and not too much of an open stand against. And in a way, you could say, you know, by our Western standards, that's not good. There should have been sanctions, there should have been, you know, a loud outcry against what was going on, which was, you know, really bad. I mean, people died from cholera and the government wasn't working. But gradually, with uh, South Africa putting money in, it's part of everything. The situation has improved. Some of the refugees are going back. I had a graduate student in uh, Botswana. He and his wife are refugees. He, he, they've gone back. People have gone. People have started to go back, which is you know was a, you know, one of the purposes. No. Um, the hospitals are working more or less. The schools are open again. There's no more cholera. The water may not be changed to drink anymore, but at least you know, things have improved. So, in that extent, it has worked out. Uh, but I would just like to, on balance, point out a couple of things. It's not as if Ebeke and the South African government totally supported Mugabe. They said it's regrettable, but we have our own way of dealing with it. And I can give uh, several examples that I found of uh, how um, South Africa opposed, for example, the South Africa supported Zimbabwe being suspended from the Commonwealth. Zimbabwe is still suspended from the Commonwealth. And South Africa. Um, and the other members of the South African development community have prevented, like, you know, they have this thing, this where one government chairs the meetings every year. But ever since the problems of 2008, Zimbabwe has not been allowed to chair. Like, when their turn comes up, they can't chair the meetings. So there's basically, you know, they can be there, but they can't chair. Maybe that's where Mugabe went to one hotel, who knows? Anyway. All right. So let's try and do some analysis of this in terms of going back to the series. And I'm just going to look at three of the series, um, because otherwise we'll be here all day. Uh, in terms of uh, classical realism, national interest, uh, you can see why the government of South Africa may want, may want to support Zimbabwe and Mugabe. First of all, there was a refugee issue. Hmm? As long as uh, they took a tough stand against Mugabe, they were faced with many refugees. About two million left over the decade, most of them to South Africa. This created a big problem, I don't know if you, some of you remember, in 2008, there was anti-refugee riots in the poorer slums, uh, in the, uh, what they call the uh, townships of South Africa, and a number of Zimbabweans and Mozambicans were killed. In the, Mozambique is a different issue, but they were killed during these riots. Now, to you and me, we look at them, and you may think that a Zimbabwean looks like a Mozambican, looks like a South African, but they can tell the difference, and for that matter, 
At least I can tell them, right? And Botswana, for one. Hmm? They do look different, you can tell. Which have been there for a while. And now they speak different language, too. Hmm? So, yeah. So, uh, the languages are distinctive, right? So you can tell if you're a person has a language. The other thing is that Zimbabwe is South Africa's principal trading partner. What it was until just last year, China overtook Zimbabwe as South Africa's main trading partner. So uh, this is important to South Africa. They want to be able to trade. They don't want to be shut out of the market in, in Zimbabwe. South Africa is a, it's the wealthiest country in Africa, but by world standards, it's not wealthy. It has a huge divide between the rich and the poor. And you still have these shack, you know, these suburbs, these uh, uh, what they call townships, which are slums where people live in shacks. And you can go there. When you go there as a tourist, they take you there. I did it once, and I never want to do it again. What's the tourism in going to see people living in shacks? No? I don't see that. But anyway, they do it. You can do it. Um, and then South Africa is a major investor in the valley. About 60% of the stocks of in the Bali Stock Exchange are South African dominated companies. So South Africa has a real interest in, in the Bali. So in realism, you could explain right, some of this. But the other issue, and the one that uh, Sarah sparked by him, my mind was, is the one of African identity. Uh, and Becky spent, whereas uh, Mandela was on, on Robben Island, you know, sizzling stones in a quarry without eye protection, you know, and this kind of stuff. Um, uh, Ebeke was traveling around as a, you know, representative of the African National Congress. For the most part, his father was a lot of but he was not. And um, so he worked with other African governments. And Ebeke is a real advocate of an African identity. You may have heard of European identity. You've got lots of talk because you're coming on European things, right? And there's a lot of talk, and I've written on European identity. And Becky advocates an African identity. In 1996, he made a famous speech, which you can find on the internet, which is called I Am an African. It's about two and a half, three pages. And there he goes on about I'm an African. I, uh, he talks about the hills, the rivers, the valleys, the animals, you know, the, uh, the lines and the antelope. His, you know, I'm an African. And so he has a strong sense of an African identity, which he thinks is needed to develop Africa and make it like hmm? uh, less dependent on the outside world. And he was one of the prime, um, in, 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 the prime inspiration behind the idea that um, the African Development Program, not the World Bank, not the IMF, but Africa. So the African Union now has a program called NEPA. Um, oops, what does NEPA stand for? Economic something, the African development, development in Africa, anyway, it's NEPAC. And it's a, a program of the, a development program where they try to raise money and help African governments develop their economies with, Af with money that Africans have raised. And then they have a, something called a peer review mechanism, whereby African governments evaluate what they have done. It's not the World Bank again, it's not the IMF coming and telling them what to do, it's Africans for Africans. And that was largely in Becky's inspiration. Um, so uh, the idea is not, not to have Westerners preach to Africans about human rights or good governance, but to have Africans work out what, work, what works for Africa. And this is something Becky practiced, right? And that implies also to Zimbabwe. Uh, Zimbabwe is an African country. We'll handle it in our, in our African way. We're not going to do Western style preaching or Northern start preaching, as they would say, right? And then the third set of theories is um, historical institutionalism, hmm? or uh, past dependency. And that set of that theory basically is, the Americans call it past dependency, the British call it historical institutionalism, and you have to really split hairs and say, what do you do with that slide? Can I go back here? I don't remember the talking about No, it's missing. Wow. Okay. Anyway, um, the uh, the idea here is that uh, that uh, what a government does is largely shaped by what came before. You know, it's very difficult to change people's mindsets, and the Americans call that path dependency, and the Buddhists call it historical institutionalism. You can split hairs and find a difference, but to me, it's more or less the same. Right? Hmm? Yeah. And um, 
you can use that, and I don't know why the slide is missing it, but anyway, yeah. I'm sure it's done myself, I mean, what else to do. But anyway, the idea here is th that um, in the case of South Africa and Zimbabwe, that the fact that the Zimbabweans help the South Africans, that they have these common bonds, hmm, going back to the liberation struggle. But there was no, there's another little story I came across, not a story really, but uh, the division between the opposition and the government in Zimbabwe is largely tribally based. It's a good thing about South Africa, it doesn't really have the tribal politics, no, that's Botswana. But, um, hmm? uh, but in, in Zimbabwe, the um, majority Shona people, uh, led by Mugabe, and the minority Nebeli, Nebeli I can't pronounce it, N-D-E-B-E-L-A, you pronounce it. But anyway, Nebeli, those people are um, related to the Zulus of South Africa, and so they have their more links to South Africa. So before Mugabe, before independence, the South Africans fell closer to the opposite, to the other movement led by a man called Nakomo, because Zulus are the, the largest single ethnic group in South Africa. Hmm? South Africa has 11 languages. He ground bad off his t badly off his too, they have 11. Mm -hmm. But Zulu is the largest single ethnic group in the country. And so um, the, the Nebli are basically Zulus who were forced north in the 19th century. So, or the 18th and 19th century, anyway, in wars before even the Dutch got there. So anyway, so that changed, switched over, so it doesn't go back historically that much, but still, they ate that tradition of the, con the brotherhood of the liberation struggle. There is, you know, the links between Mugabe and Mbeki going back to that, hmm? to that struggle. There is that identity that comes from, or historical, hmm? the fact that these were two countries governed by a white minority who tried to segregate the country and mistreat the blacks, which is not the history eh, of the rest of Africa at all, except for the maybe which is a very special case. Hmm? So, um, these are the three series that I think have the most promise in interpreting the Zimbabwean case, I haven't dealt with the other cases. And I can stop there, or I can go on. Okay, if your people have questions or comments. Hmm? Did uh, Nelson Mandela react to um, Becky's policy? No, not really. No, he more or less did. Tutu did. Tutu did, but not, not Nelson. No, he let him do his thing, you know? And Becky let Nelson Mellon do his thing, right? And then he said all the statements, he's revered, but no. No, he doesn't say really, no. Not that he would speak out in favor of Mugabe, but he's not really spoken out of the issue. Hmm? You agree? Yeah? Mandela has not spoken out with Becky in favor, no. no. And now, of course, we have a new president, Zuma. But his foreign policy, I don't think, is so different from that of. Uh, from that of um, and Becky. He also wants to practice quiet diplomacy. He's um, not this path dependency. What? The slide is there. Is it there? The previous slide is path dependency. Exactly. Why, why did I not get it? Yeah, yeah that's nice. Yeah, there you go. And that's Paul Pearson. Hmm? And French call it historicity. What? Historicity is a French scholar? I'd like to know. We'll learn something good. Okay. What time is it? Ten to two. Ten to two. Ten to two. Ten to one, I hope. Oh, sorry. Ten to one. <laughs> <laughs> ten, to ten to two would be really bad. <laughs> 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 ah. Any questions, comments? You want to add anything to that? Um, anything else? Not that I can think of right now. We're going to try to make this in an article. We're working our way out of it. We're trying to make it into an article, put it into a prestigious academic journal. Hmm? <laughs> See, because I think, but actually, there's been a whole spate of articles on South Africa and Zimbabwe. But we're going to try to do other things. And there's a huge, um, there's a big biography of um, Mbeki, written by a South African scholar, an uh, African speaking one, Givissa. I have it in, anyway, none, none of this is in our library. I got it, I mean, tell it, both of them. There's two, two versions of that biography. The big African version, which is about yay big, and then the North American version, which is about half the size. And I got them both on Intel I loan, because we don't have them here. Hmm? And uh, your, it's a sad story, because they can't use the robots. The robots doesn't have them. One of them it has, the other one, I don't know, I forgot. But anyway, it came from Trent. Hmm? Stuff came, one from Trent and one from Bok. 
We've heard of uh, Mbeki's uh, position on, on AIDS research. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, that, uh, would you like to elaborate on that? Well, that's, yeah, that, I mean, you said African identity thing. He, see, he basically interprets uh, AIDS as some kind, you know, the whole, um, you, you know, Bill Gates and the Americans have this foundation to fight AIDS in Africa. Mm. I don't know if you know, but AIDS has two, there are two major strains, and the one that people get here is the less virulent one, and the one in Africa is much more virulent. It spreads more rapidly and kills people more quickly. So the Gates Foundation and the Americans have come up with all this money, and like Botswana is, <coughs> Botswana and Swaziland are vying for the role of a country with the highest incidence of AIDS <coughs> in the world. You know, one day it's Swaziland, depending who keeps the statistics for other days, Botswana. It's not Zimbabwe or South Africa. But anyway, um, the, Becky had this idea that this was, uh, then the Americans are in, in a big way, right? Because they quit, claim quite rightly that, you know, you have to get rid of these diseases before the country can really develop. I mean, in the case of Botswana, they have a wonderful health system, you know. I would, you know, they have everything there. I had a medical problem this summer, I checked it, they, they have CT scans, they have everything. But um, the, the um, average age of death has gone down because of AIDS. People die, and, uh, and so they make there in a big way to try and uh, fight AIDS, and they're preaching basically. It doesn't work, and so and Becky and Turbo is kind of a assault on African values. The whole thing, like what the Muslim Judeo Christian tradition of you know sex is something only for marriage, or sex is something evil, right? It doesn't exist in Africa. Sex is just a part of your life. Hmm? It's just a part of your life. It's absolutely wrong with having sex at any age, any time with anyone. There's nothing wrong with it. That's just the way life is. You just have to think differently. It's not the way it's you, huh? And then and Becky interpreted this as kind of a Western plot, and he didn't think, he didn't believe, you know, the Western science, which said that mm -hmm. it's a sex which spreads AIDS. Hmm? He just refused to accept it, and he came up with, tried to come up with African solutions. And he was totally wrong. It was totally wrong. Mm -hmm. And even other Africans where, you know, everybody spoke out against it, they were em embarrassed by it. Hmm? Even the current president, who has four wives and heaven knows how many other girlfriends, but, and he's, uh, by the way, you mustn't think that of all the outside of the Muslim parts of Africa, only the Zulus have more than one wife. It's not like everybody in Africa has more than one wife. Only the Zulus. They're the only ones. So, and Zuma is a Zulu, so he has four wives and he had to. Anyway, so, but it was an embarrassment to everyone. He, it was part of his effort and identity thing, mm -hmm. right? He started the Western part. If you go to, I don't know, I don't know, but Botswana, Botswana, and you have, they have a huge program, and if you're a citizen of, some, of Botswana and you get AIDS, you can get all these dogs free from the government. And it's expensive, major, part, and a lot of financed by the Gates Foundation and the American government. And Botswana is calling with interns and American experts who are trying to do something about it. It's not doing any good. Because hmm? they don't understand the culture, they don't understand the country. It's not working at all. So uh, you can see where it's coming from, right? Mm. These experts don't understand. I mean, I know, I don't have any students like all of you who come there. They come there and they like the country. They like Botswana. It's a nice place. There's no, no beaches or anything, but it's a nice place. The people are nice. The standard of living is good. And then they come back as interns to work on some anti-AIDS project. But it doesn't do any good. Hmm? Mm -hmm. They have to, anyway, anyway, so that, that's where it comes from, right? It's a total lack of, 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 of comprehension, right? Hmm? Uh, uh, they don't understand. Um, there was a, the, uh, the Americans are working on this and spending so many millions and tens of millions of dollars on it, so they don't understand. Now they're coming up with maybe programs which will work better. I don't know, I don't know. They've discovered other things, you know, that may help. For example, circumcision can reduce the incident of AIDS by about six it's Circumcision is traditional among many of the tribes, so if you bring that back, right? Hmm? It may help, but it doesn't get rid of it, but it helps. Anything it helps, you know, but they don't understand at all, right? So, I don't know. Hmm? so um, just outside the university, they have a big billboard, which is devoted to the anti-AIDS campaign. And it changes about every four or five months. Hmm? And the first poster was, very, was a very good one, the one when I first came there. It had a very typical Botswana-looking woman, and a typical Botswana-looking man, and the man going out the door, and the woman is in the house, and she, he's, his, uh, there's a Botswana saying that you don't ask your partner where he's been, but if you want to prevent AIDS, you, you, know, you must ask, right? Hmm? That was good. 
Then the next poster came. And it was a huge orange thing. And it had sort of shadowy looking figures in the middle and other shadowy figures with lines in between the background. And the saying was, who's in your sexual network? And this was supposed to be an anti-AIDS poster. And I said to one of the American interns whom I knew, where'd you get this stupid poster? Like, in the United States, having a sexual net network may be reprehensible. In Africa, it's normal. It's not going to convince anybody of anything. Hmm? Oh, well, it was approved in Washington by headquarters. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the answer. It's, it's a big issue, right? It's a, it's a big issue in South Africa, too, because South African government can't afford the drug the way the Botswana government can. So they have a silly argument. I don't know if they've settled it. Like, when, you, when a person gets AIDS, the, blood, the immune count in the blood goes down. The white blood, I don't know how it works, maybe you do, I don't know. But anyway, the immune count. And in South Africa, it's an issue in, in Botswana, I know it's something, it's some magic number like 40 or 45. I have no idea what it means, at which point they start giving the free drugs. But in South Africa, it's something like 10 or 11, because they can't afford But this time, the person is really sick. And, mm -hmm. hmm? and they're arguing whether they should raise it, because they don't have the money, because South Africa has like 48 million people. And Botswana has 2 million, and even if, you know, one third of the young adults have AIDS, you can afford it. And then there's still a stigma. There's no stigma to sex, but there's a stigma to having AIDS. So people don't want to come forward and get the drugs and they'll get sick. You know, you know. Um, and it's right across, it's not just like a poor people's problem. It's right across one of the sisters of one of my colleagues had a baby and she said, oh, you know, my sister had a cesarean and she can't breastfeed. I knew right away she had AIDS. Right away, because you can't breastfeed. Then you know you can prevent the child getting. But she didn't say my sister had AIDS. She just said my sister can't breastfeed, and I knew. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Alexander. Well, what? Well, what is it? You have to develop your ideas, right? Sarah, mm -hmm. she was my inspiration. Never keep working on it. And uh, thank you, everyone, for.